Two weeks ago, according to the Los Angeles Times, in South LA, about 5,000 people lost their power. And the entirety of the blame for that is because some people could not seem to contain their expression of love for one another. It turns out that on Valentine's Day, metallic balloons got caught up in some electrical equipment. In the days leading up to February 14th, people were warned, don't release those balloons. But of course, they didn't listen, did they? So the question becomes, what did these people do in Southern California to deserve this retribution from God to suffer their power being cut off? And the answer to such a question would be quite rightly, Bradley, are you out of your mind for even suggesting such a thing? After all, some nut just let a balloon go and it hit power equipment. And of course, they would be right. And yet, if you go to the internet, like I did, and just Google natural disasters blamed on sinners, page <laughs> after page after page will tell you who specifically was at fault for hurricanes and earthquakes and tsunamis. One site that I especially liked was kind of an equal opportunity blamer in saying that both President Obama and Governor Romney caused God to smoke the eastern seabird with Hurricane Sandy just prior to the election. Well, with respect to earthquakes and tsunamis, it is kind of fascinating to think that what someone does today can trigger the beginning of a catastrophic plate tectonics or shifts in the Earth's crust that thing that's 21 miles of rock below us. And what makes it kind of difficult for someone today to cause that to, action, act, to happen is that actually all that movement started three billion years ago, mm -hmm. causing this seismic activity to strike along fault lines. Even so, there is always a lot of ink that's used up to headline how one group or another is responsible for God's wrath when it comes to natural disasters. Now, there is a natural tendency for us to look for a cause of calamity, and on occasion, there is such reason to believe. I had a professor, Dr. Harvey Guthrie, who was an expert in Old Testament thought, who said that when we align ourselves with chaos, we can expect to reap the fruit of our labors. The Egyptians, who were relentlessly pursuing the Hebrews during the Exodus, were bound to get stuck in the mud because that's where they were headed. It just was there for them to drop into. But in the opening sentences of our reading from the Gospel according to Luke, we hear about two awful things that happen, which history records nowhere else. But they had to have people who were wondering about the conduct of those who were killed, causing them to deserve what they got. <coughs> One incident involved what is thought to be a fight in the temple, and another, the falling of the tower at Siloam. In a kind of curious twist, some scholars think that the fight in the temple was between two groups that were trying to outrighteous one another, and that the tower event might have been actually terrorism against King Herod. Nevertheless, some lost their lives, and then they went into that default position that the usual thought at the time was that their fate was due to their sin. What did they do to deserve this? And if, in the case of the folks killed by the tower crash, if they were the ones who caused it, and this was actually part of a holy event to punish the oppressor of God's chosen people, why then would God ever take their lives in return? What kind of sin would have caused that? So the issue is, basically, we have tragedy, and then we have a cause of that tragedy, and the cause is Sin. What sin caused that disaster? Well, as Jesus was wont to do in these kind of situations, he decided to tell them a parable. 
about a non-productive fig tree and manure, a parable which always reminds me of what I really hope is a true story concerning Bess and Harry Truman. It seems that one day Mrs. Truman was taken aside by another lady who complained that the president said manure with great liberality and frequency and that that was unbecoming of a man who was the president of the United States for God's sake. To which the first lady replied, it's taken me years to get him to use the word manure. <laughs> So it might be unrelated on the face of it. But let's look first of all at the parable and then in a few minutes return to that which prompted it. The parable that we have is actually one that concerns the forgiveness of sins, God's forgiveness of us. And it takes a little while to get to that. But to begin, we have this fig tree that finds itself in a vineyard. And the fig tree is not producing fruit doesn't make any sense because vineyards, when you think about it, are for grapevines, not trees. The second thing is that the tree, which really does not belong there, therefore, in the first place, really is unproductive. So not only is it taking up space that could otherwise be given over to grapes, it's not doing what it is supposed to do. And therefore, it makes perfect sense for the owner of the vineyard to do what any self-respecting farmer would do, and that is tell the hired hand to get rid of it, remove it, chop it down. But the gardener comes in and stands up for the tree's defense and says, let it be, which interestingly are the exact same words for forgive it, that very word that Jesus said from the cross. And then the gardener says that he will put manure on it and see if it bears fruit. Wasn't that interesting? Instead of following the wisdom that, that uh, should prevail, that is to get rid of a tree by punishing it, by chopping it down, the gardener, who of course is the Christ figure in all this, announces that he will take that which is decaying, that which is in the world's view of things rotting, and we'll dig it in among the roots so that the tree can actually be transformed. What he's talking about, of course, is his impending death. And when that is placed among and within our roots, we will find that we too will have found new help. The tree on its own is incapable of changing its ways, and so are we to that extent of achieving righteousness. Something has to come from beyond and make the difference in both the case of the tree and in us. And that something is the death of Jesus on the cross and the life that is promised as a result of it. And then if that doesn't work, go ahead and chop it down, right? If the power of the resurrection is not sufficient, then go ahead and give up. And therein, of course, lies the humor in all of this. Because once forgiven, once let to just be, life begins to flourish, doesn't it? And what is critically important in this is to realize that the thriving production of fruit in both the tree and the people will be due to the death and decay found in the manure and the cross, and not in the tree, or those who gaze at it, coming to grips with some kind of a moral imperative. Jesus also is telling the story with his fingers crossed behind his back, because even though Luke didn't remember it at this point, both Luke and Matthew recalled our Lord speaking about forgiving sins in the case of Luke seven times in the course of a day, and in Matthew, of course, forgiving seven times 70 times. There will always be enough forgiveness to go around in order to lead to life. So then, how does the first part of this reading concerning all those deaths and the belief they were connected to sin tie in now with the second part, this parable we've been discussing? Well, in the first part, those around Jesus concentrated on the fact that awful things happen and that sin is undoubtedly behind disaster. 
on a cosmic scale. In the parable, Jesus' concern was actually for bringing new life into the world, rescuing those who saw no hope, and pleading for the space and the time for them to embrace new life. An unproductive tree, very much like someone missing the mark, does not bring about God's tossing an earthquake our way to get our attention, or the chopping down of a tree for that matter. Instead, the business of God always through Jesus is to nourish all of those who are affected and afflicted by natural calamity with the resurrection of Christ. Now, in the ways of the world, it's sometimes a real challenge for us to believe this. We've grown accustomed to blaming, and we've also grown accustomed to trying to clean up our acts sufficiently, not unlike Harry Truman did with his language, to warrant the approval of God and therefore stand in a right relationship with God. And while there is always a lot to be said, for comporting ourselves in love, doing what we can to spread the gospel and relieving sufferings, that is not what wins us the favor with God. Instead, all those good things, all that stuff that comes from being in God's favor are the fruit of having been recipients of God's grace all along. So, while others are going to spend a lot of time working hard at blaming the next tsunami on something that someone said or something that someone did, we've actually been called to invest ourselves as agents of the resurrection in the lives of all those around us and to do what we can to alleviate suffering when lousy things happen to the creatures of God. And when you think about that, we've been really given quite the privilege to be in the business of turning the world upside down. But that's the work of Christ, and that's the joy we have of completing. Amen. Amen.